happening right now on Morning News Now. Congressional chaos this morning. House Republicans heading back to Capitol Hill without a leader as the candidates for the next House Speaker work to end the infighting. If we can't come together as a team, how are we going to get done for the American people what, what they sent us here to do? We'll have the latest on the race for the speakership, including the major endorsement just made by Donald Trump. Plus, what NBC News has learned about the former president's plans to visit the Capitol for the first time since January 6th. Also this morning, an about face at the southern border. The Biden administration reversing its own policy and allowing more construction on the controversial border wall. This as thousands of migrants make their way into the U.S. More on the move and the mixed reaction on both sides of the aisle. Plus, Super Soaker. It's about to be another wet weekend for millions of Americans. We're tracking Tropical Storm Philippe as it barrels towards the Northeast. Plus, where freeze alerts are already in effect this morning. And good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe is on assignment this morning, so you're stuck with me on this Friday. We're going to get started with the developing battle over who will become the next Speaker of the House of Representatives. The process to elect Kevin McCarthy's successor is expected to get underway next week. We know two House Republicans, Jim Jordan and Steve Scalise, have already thrown their hats in the ring. Meanwhile, sources tell NBC News former President Trump is considering a visit to the Capitol early next week. It would be his first visit since before the January 6th attack. Overnight, Trump endorsed Jim Jordan to be the next speaker, saying he would be great in the leadership role. In an interview with our Ali Vitali, Jordan discussed why he is running for the job. That's what we have to focus on. It's like if we can't come together as a team, how are we going to get done for the American people what, what they sent us here to do? Um, that's why I'm running. I think I can bring our team together, and I think I can take the message uh, to the country to build support for what we're doing and the changes we're trying to make here. NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin is back with us this morning with the latest. Hi, Julie. Good to see you. So what more can you tell us about Trump's endorsement of Congressman Jim Jordan and explain why the former president, like I mentioned, is considering heading to Washington next week? Yeah, hey, Savannah, good morning. Well, the former president's endorsement of Jim Jordan doesn't come as a huge surprise, considering what an ally Jordan has been for the former president and what a thorn he has been for the current president, Joe Biden. Jordan uh, chairs the uh, Judiciary Committee, the Weaponization Subcommittee. He's been a key player in the impeachment inquiry that Speaker McCarthy uh, had launched uh, into the current president. And Jordan's always had the former president's back. You'll remember during the longest shutdown in 2019, 34 days, Jordan helped orchestrate and push that in Congress. And he couldn't tell Ali, our colleague, uh, that he wouldn't have done what McCarthy had done to keep the government open. He said he's not going to work with Democrats. He's going to unite the conference. Uh, and he's going to look to the former president, of course, who can potentially, according to our sources, come to the Capitol on Tuesday, as early as Tuesday, to unify the conference around Jordan for that support as well. The question is, will that work for moderates? But here's what Jordan had to say in terms of working across the aisle. Watch. I wouldn't go to Democrats to get votes because they're going to want something, you know, they're going to want something. Um, you'd have to do that within the Republican conference. And so uh, I do think I'm the guy, though, that can unify the conference. Whether we can unify on that issue, we'll, we would see. But unify the conference and then also take the message to the American people about what we're doing to help them. So you heard Jordan there. He was talking about a motion to vacate. Some Republicans want to reform those rules after what happened to McCarthy, where any one member could bring that up. Jordan said he's not so keen on that idea unless the majority of this conference wants that. So let's talk a little bit more about what we are hearing from Jim Jordan and really what we're hearing in terms of how the party is feeling about it. I mean, are people coalescing around him? Does it seem to be like it's headed in that direction? Well, that's the big question, because in addition to Jordan, we have Steve Scalise, who's a member of leadership, who has also jumped into the fold. I'm told, according to sources, that both Jordan and Scalise have been talking to different key factions of the Republican conference. They've been trying to solicit those votes. Jordan even joked uh, to our colleague that he's been losing his voice because he's trying to get everyone really to come around him, and Scalise is trying to do the same on his side. There's also a few other candidates who are considering jumping in. For example, Kevin Hearn, who is the chair of the Republican Study Committee. But remember, the magic number here is 217. When, when they want to become speaker, they have to get those votes locked in. The key is, according to McCarthy, who made this message clear last week when he was talking to his colleagues, uh, they don't want that same embarrassment that they faced when he tried to become speaker. Remember those 15 rounds of votes on the floor? They want to try to get it done behind closed doors. That's kind of the key with the former president coming to see if he can unify that process 
The question is, though, will it get done uh, soon? Will it get done even as soon as next Wednesday? Mm -hmm. That's really uh, determined to be seen because there is such a slim majority and moderates and vulnerable members are not so hot on Jordan, particularly with that Trump endorsement. But Jordan has told them uh, behind closed doors that he's not going to put them in those tough positions. Absolutely. Julie, also, let's just talk about next week and what we're going to see. So the election of a new speaker will get underway in earnest. Give us a preview of what takes place in the House. What will we see? How does this work? Yeah, exactly. So they're basically going to come back into town as early as Monday evening. They're going to have some of those closed conference meetings. You're seeing that calendar on your screen. October 10th, Tuesday, that's where they're, when they're going to have that candidate forum behind closed doors. They're going to basically hear from all the candidates, including Jordan and Scalise, maybe some others who want to run for speaker. They're going to hear their pitch out, and then they're going to coalesce and try and make a decision. That can happen as soon as Wednesday. That House Republican speaker election that you're seeing, that's going to happen behind closed doors. That doesn't mean that that automatically uh, triggers that process for a full House vote on the floor where, again, that 217 is needed. And what we saw last time where it took many ballots, remember, McCarthy was the favored candidate behind closed doors. When he went onto the floor, that became a different problem for him. The problem now is how long is this going to drag on? Because remember, there's a key government funding deadline coming up mid-November, 40 days, seems like a long time away, but really it's a lot of work they have to get done with passing those spending bills. There's also the key question of Ukraine aid, border security proposals that conservatives want as well. And all of this can't happen until there's a speaker in the House. The House is effectively frozen. So that's why this race is so important. All right, Julie Serkin, up early and on this for us. Thank you so much. Well, now let's go to the border crisis and a major reversal in the Biden administration's border policy. President Biden is now waiving more than two dozen federal laws to allow for more border wall construction in southern Texas. But you'll remember the border wall was the cornerstone of former President Trump's immigration policy. And when President Biden took office in 2021, he said American taxpayer dollars would not be used to continue construction of the wall. So now, in what seems to be a major change of course, the administration is opening its path to expedite border wall construction. And it comes at a time when the southern border is seeing a surge in migrants. On Wednesday, U.S. Customs and Border Protection said nearly 10,000 undocumented immigrants crossed the border, and that number is actually slightly down from the daily record of 11,000 crossings reached last week and back in early May. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley joins us now on this. Hey, Julia, good morning. So the surge in border crossings is really putting a strain actually on cities across the country, but of course on border communities, these communities along this wall. What do we know about this new construction, and does the president think that this is a viable solution to the problem? Has he conceded that? if he's freeing up these funds. Well, it's interesting. The president has not conceded that, but Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas wrote in the Federal Register that there was a need to expedite the building of border barrier, what Trump would call the wall, because of acute influx of migrants at the border. So that's acknowledging that there's a problem and that this might be the solution for it. But there's a huge discrepancy from what we saw from the White House yesterday, where Biden said, look, walls are not the answer. He was asked that by a reporter in the Oval Office, that walls are not an effective tool at keeping migrants out. And Karine Jean-Pierre told reporters at the White House that this was all because Congress had tied their hands. They didn't want to build the wall, but they had to because of appropriated funds in 2019. I think, though, what we can see is a spinning from this administration because then Mayorkas's message changed later in the day. There's a statement that came out from DHS that really reflected the White House's statement saying their hands were tied by Congress. But people I've spoken to have said, look, just because Congress appropriated that money, you could perhaps have a legal fight that it was their right to do it, but they weren't, their backs were not against a wall by a judge saying that they had to use this in this way. And, you know, if it really were, um, ordered by Congress to build this wall, why now and why in the Federal Register would the Homeland Security Secretary say it was because of the influx at the border? It's clear that they're also trying to send a tougher message now because these numbers have gotten so high, not just at the border, but also in cities like New York and Chicago. And we saw that also yesterday with an announcement that they'll start restarting deportations to Venezuela. So let's get into a little bit what we of what we have heard from the president on this before. I mean, he spent a lot of his 2020 campaign speaking out against border walls. I want to play a little bit of that. 
There will not be another foot of wall constructed on my administration. So, of course, as we're discussing administration walking that back, is this because it's receiving mounting pressure even from Democrats? Yeah, I think they definitely are receiving pressure. We've seen Democrats, especially those who have districts along the border, uh, say that more needs to be done. But you haven't really heard the wall come up as a top thing to do. I do think they were starting to run out of options. They came up with a really comprehensive plan when Title 42, this COVID-19 restrictions, ended in May to try to restrict asylum to anyone who hadn't previously claimed it in another country on the way there. They also thought Mexico would do more to interdict migrants before they reach a southern border. So far, those policies have really proven to not be as strong as they thought that they could be. In fact, migrants are now more likely to be able to be released into the United States now than they were under Title 42 because those sheer numbers are just overwhelming them. They're not able to put them under this new rule and push them back because they still had to be processed. And so in order to alleviate overcrowding, they've still released the majority of these migrants with court dates. So with that overwhelming has meant a need for new solutions. And I think that it's been hard for them to figure out exactly what those solutions could be. Uh, they haven't gone back to detaining families. They've not gone back to remain in Mexico. There was two Trump policies they did use. Of course, they're not going back to separating families. And uh, let's hope that's something no one else does. Uh, but this idea of the wall is something that they're now bringing up. And it's really interesting because it's something that Democrats and a lot of border officials of both parties uh, have said for a while might not really be a very effective tool, really just sends more of a message. I've seen parts of the border where migrants can build a ladder or cut a hole in the wall. Right, right. Um, what kind of response is this getting generally? A wide response. I mean, the crazy thing is we were told by DHS, all the reporters were, look, we told you all this June 30th. I, if I missed that email, that's on me. But I think every other reporter on the beat missed that email, too. It wasn't covered at all in late June that they had intention to continue this construction. And it really just got news this week when they decided to waive these federal laws to expedite the process. And so it's getting a lot of reaction, uh, both uh, in government and also in the media. And to people who are asking some really genuine questions in the White House briefing room about why uh, this is happening now and pressing them on the fact that this is that could be in response to, to border numbers. And Julia, quickly before I let you go, I do want to talk about what I mentioned at the top, which is the fact that this is not just border cities that are impacted. It's being felt well beyond that. Tell us the situation there, Illinois, New York, states like that where a lot of these migrants have been bussed. Yeah, that's right. I've spent time in New York. I just got back from Chicago less than six hours ago. And, uh, you know, I was there where they have lots of migrants who are sleeping outside police stations, even on the floors of police stations, tent cities and parks, tents along that median on the iconic Lakeshore Drive, migrants at O'Hare Airport. And I spoke to community leaders who said, look, they want to help these migrants, but they're worried that Chicago hasn't done enough early on to build out big places where people, where these migrants can live in the winter. Uh, and so now they're worried about what that means since there's already a housing crisis in many areas of Chicago and they need to take care of the needs of some poor and homeless and, uh, and you know, food scarce Chicagoans. And so they're trying to look to city officials and the federal government to see what they might do to help. In fact, there was a DHS team on the ground in Chicago yesterday trying to help the city come up with answers to those very questions. Julia Ainsley, as always, we appreciate your reporting on this. Well, this morning, there are new developments in the legal battles facing former President Donald Trump. On Thursday, Trump's legal team filed a motion calling on the judge to dismiss his 2020 federal election interference case, citing presidential immunity. And in a separate filing, Trump's lawyers also moved to dismiss his New York hush money case. Joining us now to discuss all this is NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Hi, Danny. Of course, we need you this morning. So thanks so much for being here. Let's start with this motion to dismiss the 2020 election interference case. So as I mentioned, Trump's legal team is arguing presidential immunity. Does Trump have a case here? Like, what does the law say about that? And why are we just hearing about this potential take on this now? Two magic words, outer perimeter. They will be at the core of this motion because if Donald Trump's activities were within the outer perimeter of being president, of presidential duties, then he has an argument that he has absolute immunity for anything that he does in office. And his attorneys take that a step further and say, by the way, even if he had a bad motive, motive has nothing to do with the analysis. 
So they're essentially arguing that even if he had he stood to gain personally, his campaign stood to gain, and it was good for him to try to remain in office, uh, they argued that that doesn't really matter as long as looking into election fraud was within the outer perimeter of presidential duties. That's their argument that Trump has absolute immunity uh, for things that he does as the president. And by the way, I'll tell you right now, uh, uh, Judge Chutkin will deny this motion. It's almost a certainty. That's my prediction. But here's the thing, it doesn't really matter because Judge Chutkin's decision will not be the final word. This is a novel, new area issue of law. It will go to the Supreme Court and there, Trump has a fighting chance. So uh, my prediction, Judge Chuckin will dismiss it. It'll be a 50 to 70 page opinion. It'll be well reasoned, uh, but it'll be appealed. And the courts will look at it de novo, both at the D.C. Court of Appeals and then at the Supreme Court. And that's the big one. Absolutely. All right. Well, I do want to turn to the other case. Trump's attorneys are now calling on a New York judge to dismiss the charges related to alleged hush money payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. And this was really about how that money was sort of logged in terms of business records. They say prosecutors waited too long to bring the case. Help us understand the point they're making, whether this could go anywhere and also why we're hearing about this now. That's actually their weakest argument. I've made this motion myself in cases of pre-indictment delay. And what happens is essentially prosecutors will sit on a case for years and years and years and only finally get around to indicting. And then by the time they do, the defense attorney is like, hey, how do I find witnesses? I mean, this is prejudicial. So those motions almost always lose. I think the stronger case is that this was never a strong case to begin with. It was a zombie case that was resurrected time and time again. Those are not my words, by the way. Those are the words of a top former prosecutor who was on this prosecution team who wrote a book, and that book features prominently in this motion. So not sure that the odds are good that the case will get dismissed, but he's got a shot on appeal. Danny, before I let you go, I do also want to talk about the fact that Trump dropped his $500 million lawsuit against his ex-lawyer, Michael Cohen, but a spokesperson for Trump says these claims would be revisited after dealing with the other legal battles. Obviously, we know how much is going on in terms of legal battles for the former president, but how should we interpret this move? You know, it's not really a legal analysis. This is probably a business decision. Mm. We call this throwing good money after bad. Do you really want to pay your lawyers $500 an hour or more, uh, probably more, Trump's lawyers, to go after someone like Michael Cohen for $500 million, which he obviously doesn't have? So this is a business decision, not a legal decision. Whether they mm. will revisit it, uh, I don't know. I wouldn't put money on that e either. All right, Danny Savella says always, thank you. Now let's get you to weather. We are tracking the latest on Tropical Storm Philippe, which is expected to bring some strong winds and heavy rain to the New England area this weekend. Already raining here this morning. Angie Lastman's here. Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning, Savannah. We've got a couple of things to talk about with regards to the rain across parts of the Northeast here. Not just uh, tomorrow, but today, too. We're going to see this uh, kind of cold front start to work its way a little farther to the east. It impacted folks from the Midwest down to the Gulf Coast yesterday, and it's not hard to see where it is. It's Notice all that rain uh, right on that leading edge of that system here as it moves farther to the east, bringing clouds with it as well as the rain. So here's the deal with how it plays out through the rest of your day today. You can see kind of those scattered showers that you're going to deal with on and off through the day today. We'll see kind of uh, the unsettled weather begin today. So umbrellas handy here as you get out the door this morning and keep them with you through the afternoon hours too. Behind that, we'll start to see temperatures take a tumble across the northeast, and they've already done so across parts of the Midwest. So you're waking up to much cooler conditions all the way back towards the Rockies. We're seeing much chillier fall-like conditions uh, like we should for parts of October. Now, as we get into your Saturday, especially into the afternoon and evening hours, we'll start to see Philippe, which by that time will likely be post-tropical. Either way, the impacts don't change, no matter what it's considered. We're still going to see a good batch of moisture start to work on shore with this. Uh, parts of New England, Atlantic Canada, we'll see uh, some of the heavier rain, and we'll definitely see that lingering into our Sunday, too. You can see much of that lingering over parts to the northeast here as we get into Sunday. So it'll be a soggy couple of days, especially on Saturday. And on top of that, we're going to see some breezy conditions too. When it's all said and done through the weekend, we could pick up another one to two inches. I think the higher amounts will be closer to three inches, maybe even up to five inches, especially the farther interior you go and the farther up into portions of northern New England, where the center of that system will likely come on shore. But either way, a soggy couple of days interrupting outdoor plans for your Saturday, especially across this region. Uh, 
as we get into tomorrow. Now, what does that mean for, you know, the, the weekend fall foliage? I know this is something that folks love to do. The good news is out west, we're talking peak colors already across the Rockies, Sierra, Cascades. That's going to be fine. We're going to see nice conditions for a lot of folks out there. Uh, in the Midwest and in the Northeast, we're, uh, we're already seeing peak color in the Midwest. This is my favorite place to go. The Upper Peninsula of, of Michigan looks good there. Unfortunately, we're near peak in northern New England, which is also a great place folks like to explore, of course, during this time of year. Unfortunately, we're going to see quite gusty winds, 30 mile per hour or higher for some spots. And of course, all of that rain, it doesn't do uh, us any uh, you know, favors when it comes to seeing those leaves and getting out there. So it'll be not yeah. only a soggy kind of couple of days, but unfortunately might impact um, of the leaves that are on the trees, oh. of course, for folks to get out there and do that favorite fall activity. So, you know, I, I'm you the bearer of called? bad news. I want to make you leaf say it. peeping. There it is! I think it's so funny. <laughs> leaf peeper. I will. I, You're a leaf am, peeper. Am I one? I think so. I want to be one. Are All you? right, Angie. I, I, I would like to be one as well. Okay, let's go. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but maybe, I mean, I don't know. We could probably do it a little bit, at least in Central Park. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, All right. good idea. Let's go. <laughs> Angie Lassman, we'll see you in a little bit. Thank cool. you. Well, coming up on Morning News Now, plot twist. Hollywood writers back at work after a month-long strike. But for one show, it won't be business as usual. We will explain why later this hour. Up first, the new this morning, high honors while behind bars. We'll tell you about the winner of this year's Nobel Peace Prize after the break. Stay with us. Climate change and severe weather are contributing to a growing food challenge in China, which so much of the world depends on. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer explains how China is responding. From record rainfall to scorching heat, dramatic swings testing China's ability to cope with the changing climate. This summer, the heaviest rain in 140 years caused wide-scale flooding here that destroyed fields and tons of crops. The corn is soaked, the fields, the furniture. It's all garbage, he says. Last year, intense heat waves triggered the worst drought in decades. He's saying this is what it looks like when rice doesn't grow. It's all dry. Climate change is feeding a quest to shore up China's food supply. Food security now a national priority for China's President Xi Jinping. To produce more and import less at a time when geopolitical tension is rising too. The challenge in China, feeding one-fifth of the world's population with only 10% of the world's arable farmland. A campaign to expand farmland has reclaimed nearly half a million acres nationwide for staple foods like rice, soybeans and wheat. It's all rice, this woman says, even in the local graveyard. In some places, parkland was bulldozed to make room for corn. Concerns over food security are deeply rooted here, with shortages sparking unrest during the pandemic. It has authorities fixated on food technology, too. So each year we can harvest the six times for the crop. Six times? Yeah. Scientists are using indoor vertical farming and say they're harvesting more in half the time without disruptions from bad weather. Because we can control the environment of these kinds of seeds, we can produce the food in everywhere. An all-out push to feed a sense of security. Janice Mackey Freyer, NBC News, Sichuan Province, China. Well, as Paris gears up for next year's Summer Olympics and throngs of international visitors, health officials there are trying to fight off a very unwelcome invader, bed bugs. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald reports on how they're trying to tackle the problem. A bed bug infestation sweeping through Paris and anxiety quickly rising. Viral videos like these causing sleepless nights with reports of the blood sucking parasites on buses and trains inside movie theaters and hotels. That is just becoming an issue for the Parisians in our daily life. Paris is a global destination with millions visiting from across the world for events like Fashion Week last month. Concerns travelers can take the bugs home. While it's a national crisis in France, the tiny bloodsuckers are a problem across the world in American cities from Chicago to New York and recently in Arizona where exterminators found massive infestations with thousands of bugs. According to the CDC, bed bugs are known to hide, tucking into seams of suitcases, folded clothes, bedding and furniture. 
While the bugs don't pose a serious medical threat, their bites can result in rashes, blisters, and allergic reactions. It's terrible. It's the most awful thing that has ever happened. Maria Melissa Guarte is an American who's lived in Paris for 26 years. She's battled bed bugs twice before. And when the exterminators came, they told me that they've been really, really busy because Paris has a real problem of bed bugs. The French government is expected to announce new emergency measures any day as this city prepares to host the Olympic Games next year. Back to you. All right, Megan Fitzgerald, thank you so much. Yikes. Well, more international headlines now. In Syria, dozens of people are dead after an unprecedented drone attack on a military school. Molly Hunter joins us now with that and other news this morning. Hey, Molly, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. That's right. We are starting in Syria, a story that has slipped from the front pages yesterday, an unprecedented attack on Syrian army infrastructure. At least 100 people were killed in an attack on a military academy. Weaponized drones struck the site just minutes after Syria's defense minister left a graduation ceremony. Moving to a suspected cholera outbreak in Zimbabwe. 100 people have died with suspected cholera cases. More than 5,000 suspected cases have been recorded just in the last month. Now the government has implemented restrictions. The health ministry is now carrying out tests to confirm just how widespread the outbreak is. And now finishing up with a very British tradition, actually, Savannah, one that I have not taken part in. There is possible scandal brewing. Every fall, the World Conquer Championships happens. And it's not what you think. Hard brown chestnuts, those are called the Conquers, are the name of the game. And you stand at arm's length and whack the other person's chestnut until it breaks. But this year, there is concern over the quality of the nuts. The Wall Street Journal reports that storms have softened the chestnuts, knocking them off the trees too early. So there is massive discussion right now over whether or not the nuts are too soft or too hard, or if they are in ideal kind of circumstances for the championships. Savannah, I will stay on this one. <laughs> Please do. How do you get into something like that? How do you <laughs> become a conquer, I guess? <laughs> All right. Molly Hunter, you'll have to go try it out for us. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, a jailed Iranian human rights activist described as a freedom fighter has won this year's Nobel Peace Prize. Nargis Mohammadi was awarded the top prize earlier this morning for, quote, her fight against the oppression of women in Iran and her fight to promote human rights and freedom for all. Mohammadi has also fought for the abolition of the death penalty. She is currently serving multiple sentences in an Iranian prison totaling about 12 years. Well, coming up, the future of college students. They're speaking out about the end of affirmative action. Show of hands if you think race should be allowed as a consideration in the college admissions process. You all do. When we come back, some high schoolers say the Supreme Court's decision is problematic in more ways than one. And another unintended side effect of a popular diabetes drug, why Walmart is blaming meds like Ozempic for a drop in purchases. This is Morning News Now. We are back now with a closer look at how high school students view the recent Supreme Court ruling on affirmative action in college admissions. MSNBC's Ana Cabrera sat down with a group of seniors to talk about how the change impacts their application process and diversity in higher education. I want to start with just a show of hands. How many in this room plan to go to college? Raise your hand. Everybody. I guess I'm not surprised. <laughs> Why is it important for you to go to college right out of high school versus entering the workforce right away? I think a college education, a college degree, is a tangible and palpable way to show that I'm ready, I'm experienced, and I can make an impact. We have this awesome, diverse group in this room. We just had the Supreme Court decision that strikes affirmative action in the college admissions process. How do you think that impacts you and your plans? As an Asian person myself, there's a very strong culture of it back in my home country in South Korea. Uh, a lot of after school extracurricular activities are focused on college prep and going to college. And to have that divide where some people are not afforded that or it's simply not a cultural notion for them, I just think that the striking down of affirmative action was very harmful. Jesus, you called it intriguing. Yeah. Why? 
some colleges have an incentive of perpetuating the system, but in a different way. It's through the essays now that they want to have a more personalized and more um, you know, specific, um, almost referral of who you are. Because what diversity really is, is it isn't what you see. It isn't the visual, but it's really here. And next, Chatra, you've said that you don't believe that this decision necessarily impacts you personally negatively. How do you see it? For me, being able to attend college in, in America is a huge privilege to me. Even um, it's recognized by my family back in India because they think it's such a huge opportunity. Um, so I have been preparing for it myself. But I think it is a disadvantage to those who have already been affected by you know their race in terms of um, college admissions. A show of hands if you think race should be allowed as a consideration in the college admissions process. You all do. Leela, you had called this Supreme Court decision a problem morally. The reason it becomes a moral issue is because I do inherently benefit from it. Um, I'm cur like personally identify as half Asian and half white. I think it's an inherent problem in our society. We've had so much systemic racism that perpetuates this inability for specifically black and Hispanic people to attend colleges. I just think that the Supreme Court ruling to strike affirmative action from colleges is just a very optimistic ruling on their part because the entire point was to create equity in a time where people were not as equal as they could be. Is it an equal playing field? Uh, it's definitely not an equal playing field. I definitely like learning more about other cultures and other people and and let's say we have a group discussion in class, I like to see uh, other people's point of views and how they think about, like, what, how they view a uh, situation. And for me, I could learn from that. It's really important to see diversity in the colleges you go to because it's not just a color of your skin thing. It's a mindset. It's sharing cultures. And it's really important for universities to take it into account. So, like, I've seen many essay prompts being posted from universities that really emphasize the idea of race and, and how that's influenced you and impacted you within your academic career. And I definitely find hope in it because if you click a box, right, which was the debate, you know, how, how much can clicking a box really tell of a student of their shared experience? Our thanks to Anna Cabrera for that discussion. Great discussion. Well, Walmart says some of its customers are buying less food and they're blaming those weight loss drugs that have become so popular. You know, drugs like Ozempic and Wagovi. Well, the CEO of Walmart's U.S. operations says those are leading to a slight pullback in overall purchases. For more, we are joined by retail Bloomberg News reporter Brendan Case. Brendan, thanks for being here. So this is quite the headline to come out of this. I mean, we've talked so much about Ozempic, but now to kind of eventually see some effects down the line as so many people are on it for quite a while. So tell us how Walmart was able to determine this link here. How are they able to say these drugs are actually maybe what's part of taking a bite out of our sales? That's right. So Walmart knows a lot about what its customers are buying, obviously. It knows a lot about what they used to buy. It knows a lot about what they're buying now. It also knows a lot about who has prescriptions for these drugs because they have such a big pharmacy business. And when you compare those two data sets, now this is all anonymized, it's very sensitive, but in terms of an overall you know, aggregate population uh, impact, they can see looking at you know past purchases and current purchases that the people who are you know who have these prescriptions are uh you know they're seeing a what they call a slight pullback in food purchases by them so you know something that is not necessarily a huge effect they're not really ready to go into great detail about which categories are the most affected but certainly something that they can measure at this point and that they're studying very closely Absolutely. Uh, another, we are also hearing from somebody else, the CEO of snack food maker Kelanova. They're also saying they're studying this as well, the potential impact these drugs are having on the dietary behavior. Do these customers ultimately, mean, excuse me, do these companies ultimately mean that these changes in customers could be changing really the future of food sales? Are they kind of going to have to shift anything? Are they doing anything to prepare? It's certainly possible. And if you, if you think about the, the sort of overall impact, there was a uh, a Morgan Stanley report last summer that that talked about people who were taking these drugs, you know, perhaps cutting their calorie consumption by, you know, something in the neighborhood of 20 percent. Um, and you could have, you know, a, a, a shift in, in what retailers call the mix. It, it's possible that they'll, you know, that those people might be particularly apt to stop buying as much of the kind of, you know, 
snack foods that tend to have mm -hmm. high profit margins that really help a lot of the, the, the food manufacturers make their money. Right. And those food companies, you know, you, you mentioned Kelanova, Conagra, the maker of Slim Jim was another one this week said, that said it was studying it. You know, these companies are looking at, do they have to reformulate products? Do they need to change something about how they make them, how they market them? Um, you know, that's all up in the air right now, but certainly something that they're looking at really closely. And I think we'll be hearing a lot more of that over the next couple of years. Yeah, and when you're up against a drug that essentially just eliminates your appetite, I'm not sure marketing is going to help anything there. But it really does sound amazing that it could be making this much of an impact. Quickly tell us, we just have a few moments here. Walmart CFO says there are some positives here, even though this might sound like bad news. Tell us about that. So, yeah, from Walmart's perspective, I mean, they do get actually a revenue bump from from selling the drugs. They've got the big the big pharmacy business. The other the other kind of wild card here, which will be interesting to watch, is is what happens to sales of non food items. You know, Walmart has the hope that you know people who buy less food might be willing to buy more of their you know fill in the blanks clothes, toys, whatever they whatever mm -hmm. else they have in the store. Um, so you know that that's a possible benefit, but time will tell. We'll we'll see how it works out. All right, Brendan Case, thank you very much. Good talker this morning. Well, coming up, more drama in Hollywood. Writers for Drew Barrymore's talk show refusing to return despite the end of the months long strike. Plus, actors and studios are back at the bargaining table. We'll bring you the latest on that one. And it's being called biohacking, but doctors say the do it yourself health craze, it comes with some big risks. What you should know up next, stick with us on Morning News Now. We are back with the latest on the actor's strike. This morning, talks are continuing between the sag After union and the group that represents studios and streamers with hopes of a deal soon. However, one show is feeling the fallout from that recently ended writer's strike. Sources tell NBC News that the three top writers for the Drew Barrymore show will not be returning. It's just the latest setback for Barrymore after her controversial decision to bring the show back during the strike, a decision she then reversed. This all played out on social media. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin has the latest here for us. Five months off and we are back. I've got a show to do. As TV studios open their doors again following the months-long writer strike, the Drew Barrymore show facing another production setback, forced to return without its head writers. Sources close to the show say offers were extended after the strike and all three writers declined. The Drew Barrymore show now interviewing new writers to fill the top positions. The fact that there are hurt feelings here leading to senior writers deciding that maybe they can find opportunities elsewhere doesn't surprise me in the least. What do we want? Fair pay. It's the latest obstacle for Barrymore, who just weeks ago faced harsh criticism after saying they would continue production during the writer's strike. I would just take full responsibility for my actions. Posting and then deleting this apology video addressing the controversy. I just wanted to make a show that was there for people. And I thought if we could go on during a global pandemic and everything that the world has experienced through 2020, why would this sideline us? The move drawing major backlash from union members on the picket lines. Barrymore later backtracking that decision and pausing the premiere until the strike ended. Many shows like Late Night and The Tonight Show already making their return with others like The Talk expected to follow close behind, all avoiding the public condemnation that Barrymore faced. I think the more lethal or the more challenging consequence she's going to have to come up against is, you know, these are her colleagues. So she's going to have to look these people in the eye and they're going to say, why did you make this decision? And really the crisis here is a crisis of trust with her own colleagues. The show now set to premiere on October 16th under a cloud of controversy. All right, our thanks to Dana Griffin for that report. Let's get you financial headlines now. The average car payment for new vehicles just hit a new record high. CNBC's Pippa Stevens joins us now with that and other news. Pippa, we've been talking for a long time how expensive it is to buy a car. Of course, you know what interest rates are like. Tell us about this. Yes, Savannah. Well, consumers who've bought a new car are on the hook for the record loan payments. 
with one in five owing at least $1,000 a month. Surging interest rates combined with high prices are making vehicles less affordable. Research group Edmonds says the interest rate on car loans averaged 7.4% in the third quarter, the highest level since 2007. The average monthly payment of $736 is a record high. New cars, trucks, and SUVs are still selling thanks to pent-up demand from the supply crunch that began during the pandemic. Meantime, Tesla is cutting prices on Model 3 and Model Y vehicles in the U.S. That could spark demand after the company delivered fewer cars than expected in the third quarter. Tesla lowering the price on the rear-wheel drive version of the Model 3 to just under $39,000 and the long-range version of the Model Y to roughly $48,500. The move comes about a month after Tesla cut prices on the Model S and Model X. And Taylor Swift is set to rule the box office. AMC says advanced ticket sales for the pop stars Eras Tour concert film, that film version, have topped 100 million a week before the movie opens in theaters in more than 100 countries. AMC saying demand for the movie has been incredibly high since the film was announced, shattering the theater chain's record for the highest single day revenue from ticket sales. Savannah, I haven't bought my ticket yet, but I'm definitely going to be seeing that. Oh my gosh, same. And I saw the Eras Tour. <laughs> IRL three times. So, you know, oh there, my there's God. a little bit about me and my love for Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Pippa Stevens, thank you so much. Well, when it comes to looking and feeling younger, some people are taking matters into their own hands and hacking their biology. NBC News Now anchor Gotti Schwartz took a look at the science behind the trend. It's a health craze taking over the internet with over 700 million views on TikTok, hashtag biohacking or hacking your body, which some will think will create a better version of yourself. Everything from wearable tech to diet shifts, gene analysis, it's the do-it-yourself approach to health, but the DIY lifestyle can be a little lonely, so why not do it together? And that's what brings me to Remedy Place, looking for the fountain of youth on Sunset Boulevard. So our whole entire club center around self-care, but with a social twist. Here you can breathe your way into the six minute ice bath club. Good, control the breath, relax the shoulders. How once wide awake. Healing has never felt did so it. cool. How about a little relaxing in the hyperbaric chambers? Okay. Meant to help increase your oxygen intake to speed up your body's healing process. I feel pretty good. What's not so relaxing? The price tag of $2,500 a month, which gets an all access membership. Cryotherapy, cupping, acupuncture, lymphatic massages, automatic foam rollers, vitamin IV drips, and more. The effectiveness of many of these treatments often unclear. For example, those vitamin IV drips, a large review of medical literature shows no clear results for those with major issues, let alone for healthy people, where it's often compared to simple hydration. But Dr. Leary, a chiropractor and founder of The Remedy Place, says the idea is about finding healthier ways to socialize meeting spot, after work hangout instead of a happy hour. Here's how he reframes the booming trend. We don't biohack, we remedy. Because there is no shortcuts with your health. The global biohacking industry, valued at nearly $17 billion last year and is projected to reach more than $80 billion by 2031. And for extreme biohackers, it is not cheap. Take 46-year-old biohacking millionaire Brian Johnson, who I met up with earlier this year. He says he spends about $2 million a year trying to be 18 again basically aging backwards. Well, we're trying to basically measure every single organ in the entire body, and then we're trying to rejuvenate the age. Which means some extremes. He takes over 100 pills a day, wears a tiny contraption on, well, his other Johnson to monitor nighttime erections. He even injected his son's plasma in him, something which he stopped doing after he said it had no benefits. Johnson says everyone doesn't have to follow his exact move, but they can use it as a guide, which a lot of people do. Teresa Skrobonik's goal was simple, live longer and look younger. I came from a family that never took care of themselves, smoked two, three packs of cigarettes a day, and they all died early. And so I thought, I'm going to do the exact opposite. She started taking handfuls of supplements and prescriptions, but they didn't have the impact she wanted. I felt worse than I did before I took it. I started getting headaches. I was taking naps twice a day. The obsession impacting her mentally. I wasn't really living. I was living to take the pills so later I could live. Now she cautions people, emphasizing working with your doctor and knowing what your body needs. I started using my body and my diet and started just doing the things I was deficient in. And I just feel a lot better. Back at Remedy Place, they're not hesitating to jump in and try to rethink health. There you go. 
there is no quick fix. That's because you're repairing. Mm -hmm. You're not anti-aging. Aging is inevitable, but doing it as best you can, that's priceless. Well, that is quite an interesting one. And our thanks to Gotti Schwartz for that report and getting into that for us. Well, coming up, it's the end of her reign. Up next, we're celebrating soccer legend Megan Rapino as she gears up for her final home match. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back, Bad Bunny, Carol G, and Peso Pluma were all big winners last night at the Billboard Latin Music Awards. Bad Bunny took home seven awards, including Artist of the Year. Get this, that is an award he has won every year since 2020. It's amazing. Carol G won five awards, including Best Album, but regional Mexican artist Peso Pluma picked up most awards of the night, a total of eight. So cool. Love that award show. Well, tonight's soccer legend Megan Rapino will play her final regular season home game for Seattle's O.L. Reign. Rapino has played her entire 11-year career with the Reign, earning her a goodbye ceremony and a sold-out stadium. She announced her retirement from Team USA at the end of the last World Cup. She leaves behind a long list of accomplishments, including two World Cups and even one Olympic gold medal. For more, we are joined by women's soccer staff writer, athlete, athletic, Steph Young. Steph, thank you so much for being here with us. So tell us what's planned for her last game. I just mentioned it's sold out. There's this ceremony. What are we going to see? Good morning. Yes, um, the rain have planned a lot around Megan Rapinoe's last game. The city of Seattle as well has planned a lot. I believe King County Council has named it Megan Rapinoe Week. Um, the ferries are going to be flying forever Rapinoe flags. Buildings downtown are going to be lighting up pink, just like her iconic hair in 2019. Uh, and I think it's going to be a record-breaking crowd, probably about 30,000 people at Lumen Field. Wow, what a crowd. You're right. So Megan Rapinoe's also been outspoken politically. If you are not a soccer fan, you may have heard of her from some of these other ways, from Black Lives Matter to Equal Pay. She even got into a war of words with the former president. Tell us a little bit about this off the field, what we know about her. Yeah, I think it's telling when everybody's been asked about her career. A lot of people have pointed to her work off the field, her activism, right. being one of the first white professional athletes to kneel in support of Colin Kaepernick during the anthem, you know, to draw attention to, to police brutality against black Americans, um, her advocacy for gender pay equity as part of their U.S. soccer's, uh, the women's national teams, their, their overall collective bargaining with U.S. soccer to achieve gender pay equity, and definitely her support of LGBTQ rights, you know, especially her advocacy for things like trans rights or human rights and letting trans kids play sports, um, especially recently. I think, you know, that's definitely part of our ongoing legacy. And it's something that all of her teammates and even a lot of her opponents have brought up as something that they really respect about her. When all is said and done, what is Megan Rapinoe's legacy between the things we've discussed here, what you just talked about, her work off the field, the gold medal, the World Cup wins, what will people look back on? It's so hard to encapsulate a decade-long career, right, mm. into kind of what couple of things will people remember. It'll probably be her advocacy. I think there's that quote, right, you may not remember what someone does, but you remember how they made you feel. And I think she talked a lot about her legacy in that way, where she wanted to make newer players feel welcome. She wanted people to feel like they could be their best, most authentic selves. Her own coach at the Reign, Laura Harvey, talked about how when she came to NWSL, the Women's Pro League, she had never lived authentically and that Megan Rapino made her feel like she could be open to be exactly who she was. So I think that'll be her legacy. People remembering, oh, she made me feel like I could be who I am in this world. How do you think the team's feeling with her stepping aside? I don't know. I think she kind of summed it up. They've obviously still got some games to play. They're trying to win, you know, get a berth in playoffs and win those playoffs. But she said, um, I hope I can keep it together tomorrow, but you can run and cry at the same time. <laughs> so that might be the entire team. Oh, you can run and cry at the same time. And do we know what's next for her? She's definitely said she's not leaving sports entirely, mm -hmm. especially after the World Cup, you know, and her retirement game in Chicago. She talked about she's not trying to leave this world altogether. So maybe we might see her going into some kind of advocacy role. Obviously, her and her partner, Sue Bird, are very active in women's sports, both, you know, East Coast and West Coast. So I really think don't cry too much because you haven't seen the last of her. <laughs> don't cry too much. I like that. Maybe a message for her as well, especially with such an incredible career. Steph Young. Thank you very much for joining us on this this morning. Thank you.
And that does it for this hour of Morning News Now, but don't go anywhere. The news continues right now. Good morning. Happy Friday. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe is on assignment right now on Morning News Now. The battle at the border is heating up with the Biden administration now set to build new sections of wall between Texas and Mexico. It's a stunning reversal from the president's previous position. We've got more on that, plus the White House's latest move to deport Venezuelan migrants who illegally cross the border. A key endorsement this morning in the high-profile race for House Speaker. Former President Trump overnight throwing his weight behind conservative firebrand Congressman Jim Jordan, a close Trump ally. What it means for the fight as Trump reportedly considers his first trip to Capitol Hill since January 6th. Help wanted this morning. We're getting the latest read on the strength of America's economy with breaking employment numbers from the past month. We'll dive into the data and what it all means for your wallet. And this morning, we're remembering Dick Butkus, the legendary Hall of Fame linebacker who passed away yesterday at the age of 80. We have got a packed show for you this morning, getting started with new developments at the border. President Biden is now waiving more than two dozen federal laws to allow for more border wall construction in southern Texas. It comes at a time when the southern border is seeing a surge in migrants. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joins us now with the details. Yeah, we are here in Texas's Rio Grande Valley, where we could soon see about 20 additional miles go up of this border barrier on the land separating the U.S. from Mexico. And it comes after Homeland Security says that in this sector alone over the last year, they have encountered about a quarter million migrants trying to cross illegally. Now, important to note here, the administration says despite this apparent construction, there is no official change to their immigration policy. But we've seen President Biden facing pressure from both sides of the aisle to do something about this ongoing migrant crisis. Along parts of the southern border, the Biden administration is now clearing the way for construction of new sections of wall. And as pressure there is growing, overnight the administration also saying it will resume deporting Venezuelan migrants. Just weeks after granting temporary protected status for those who traveled to the U.S. before August, the White House now saying they'll remove Venezuelans who arrived illegally after that date. Venezuelans currently the most common nationality of migrants trying to cross the border, where illegal crossings are on the rise. The Biden administration now waiving more than two dozen federal laws to allow Homeland Security to install about 20 miles of new physical barrier between Mexico and Stark County in Texas's Rio Grande Valley. President Biden arguing his hands are tied because Congress greenlit the project during the Trump era. I tried to get them to reappropriate, to redirect that money. They didn't. They wouldn't. Do you believe the border wall works? No. It's a major reversal for Mr. Biden, who is a candidate, had this to say. There will not be another foot of wall constructed on my administration. DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, among top officials meeting with counterparts in Mexico Thursday, said there's no change to the administration's approach. Border security requires a smarter and more comprehensive approach. But it comes as a recent surge of migrants has put a strain on resources from border communities. We are completely overwhelmed. We're done with the finger pointing and we just want solutions. To states hundreds of miles away, such as New York and Illinois, where Democratic governors have criticized the administration's handling of the migrant influx. Still, advocates like Roberto Lopez with the Texas Civil Rights Project says new walls won't deter people from coming. People are going to find a way to cross. So where do the numbers stand right now? At last check, we have seen a bit of a dip from last week where there were near record levels approached. But on this Wednesday alone, Customs and Border Protection says more than 8,000 migrants tried to cross the U.S.-Mexico border illegally. And in the month of September, that number was an all-time high for 2023, topping 200,000 migrants. That is why some are hopeful that should this extension of the border wall go up, it could hopefully drive some of those numbers down. But time will most definitely tell. Morgan Chesky, NBC News. All right, Morgan Chesky, thank you very much. Well, now to the fight over who will become the next Speaker of the House of Representatives. Republicans are scrambling to find Kevin McCarthy's replacement after he was voted out of the Speakership earlier this week. 
Well, former President Trump is now weighing in on the battle for the seat. He is endorsing Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan to become the next speaker. This comes as sources tell NBC News that Trump is considering returning to the Capitol next week for a visit for the first time since before the January 6th attack. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig joins us now with all the latest developments on this one. Hey, Garrett, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Look, the behind-the-scenes battle here is still being fought to line up the votes necessary to become the next speaker. But that overnight endorsement by Donald Trump of Ohio's Jim Jordan is going to be a major marker in how the GOP plots its future course. Overnight, former President Trump inserting himself squarely into the speaker's race, throwing his weight behind conservative Ohio Republican Jim Jordan. In a post on Truth Social, Mr. Trump writing Jordan, quote, will be a great speaker of the House and has my complete and total endorsement. Jordan is a close Trump ally. President Trump did more of what he said he would do than any president in my lifetime. And Mr. Trump had already been a looming presence in the speaker race, itself a sign of the Republican Party moving further to the right and becoming more pro-Trump. Trump saying just yesterday to Fox News Digital that he would accept a short-term role as speaker himself if the GOP couldn't decide. A lot of people have been calling me about speaker. All I can say is we'll do whatever's best for the country and for the Republican Party. It comes after former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy was ousted for Williams the first time in history by eight rebel Republicans, led by Florida's Matt Gates. If it's Speaker Jim Jordan or Speaker Steve Scalise, there will be very few conservatives in the country who don't see that as a monumental upgrade. Both candidates for the speakership are strong Trump supporters. But Jordan is a conservative firebrand, leading the impeachment inquiry into President Biden, famous for his combative style and a staunch Trump defender during both both of Mr. Trump's impeachments. The Republican Party now thrown into chaos, deeply divided as moderates with their eye on the 2024 election, still distressed by McCarthy's exit. We have an obligation to get back to work on behalf of the American people uh, to stop the interparty squabble uh, and to focus on the issues that actually matter uh, to people. Whoever the next speaker is will have a lot on their plate including avoiding yet another looming government shutdown, now just weeks away. Uh, all right, so how do we get there? The next official step in this process is a closed-door candidate forum for Republicans on Tuesday. Everybody running gets a chance to present their case. By the way, Donald Trump has been flirting with coming to that, which would be his first time back on the Hill since January 6th. And then Republicans would meet again on Wednesday to try to pick a candidate, again, behind closed doors before going to the floor. There are a lot of ghosts around. Nobody wants to repeat what they did in January, where Kevin McCarthy failed and failed and failed to get the 218 votes they need. Bottom line, Savannah, I think it's going to be another very long week on Capitol Hill. Oh, absolutely, which means another very long week for you, Garrett Hake. That's what right. a week, what a month. Get some rest this weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, the Pentagon says it shot down an armed Turkish drone that was flying close to U.S. troops in northern Syria on Thursday. It is the first time the U.S. has taken down an aircraft belonging to NATO ally, Turkey. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby joins us for more on this. Hey, Courtney, good morning. So walk us through how this whole incident unfolded according to the Pentagon. Yeah, I mean, this is a pretty remarkable event when you consider the fact that it is, as far as we know, and defense officials know, it's unprecedented. So it started about 7.30 yesterday morning local time over Syria when a couple of Turkish, armed Turkish drones started carrying out some airstrikes. They were dropping bombs as close as about a kilometer away from where U.S. troops are operating in northeastern Syria. So it's an area near Hasaka, Syria. Well, this, it was so close to the U.S. troops at the time that they they had to go in bunkers and to take to take protection. Well, of course, the U.S. military started reaching out to the Turkish government, the Turkish military, telling them exactly where their troops were and saying, hey, you need to stop these airstrikes, whatever's going on. Well, they stopped. The, the two drones uh, flew away. Fast forward about four hours when another armed Turkish drone started flying again very close to where U.S. troops were. There were upwards of about a dozen phone calls and communications back and forth between the U.S. and the Turkish government to tell them where the U.S. troops were. And they warned them that if this drone did not back away from the U.S. troops, they would take action. And in fact, they did that. They, they scrambled a couple of F-16 F fighter jets and they shot down that Turkish drone. No U.S. troops were injured or killed in the incident. But again, 
really unusual, as far as we know, unprecedented event here. What has the reaction from Turkey been like? So both Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and the new chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General C.Q. Brown, spoke with their Turkish counterparts. We got readouts from both sides. Both sides claimed that the conversations were productive and that they were really just focused on counter-ISIS operations there in northern Syria. But we haven't got a sense that the Turks agreed not to do something like this again in the near future. Of course, of course Turkey is carrying out these operations in northern Syria and northern Iraq right now to go after these PKK fighters, the Kurdistan and Workers' Party fighters who have claimed an attack in, in Ankara last weekend. So it's really not clear if, this, if these sorts of, of events may even continue going forward. We don't have an assurance from the Pentagon that the Turks uh, agreed that they would stop doing this. So, Courtney, you mentioned that attack last weekend. We know Turkey has been intensifying its strikes on Kurdish militants in northern Syria since that, as you just laid out. But some of those groups that Turkey considers terrorists, the U.S., considers allies. So help us to understand better how that is and how that could be a source of tension between both countries. Yeah, it's a really complicated situation. So there's the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers Party, that the U.S. actually recognizes as a terrorist group as, as well as Turkey. Um, but there are sort of these other groups that have Kurdish fighters in them, like the Syrian Democratic Forces, who are a strong partner to the U.S. and have been for years in northern Syria. Turkey considers elements of the Syrian Democratic Forces to also be aligned with the PKK. The U.S. disagrees. In fact, defense officials who I spoke with say that it's pretty clear that these Turkish airstrikes were going after elements of the PKK that may have included elements of the SDF, who, again, the U.S. is partnering day to day in Syria to go after ISIS fighters there. So complicated. Courtney, thank you for helping us understand. Thanks for reporting here. Well, now it is time for another check of our Morning News Now weather and get your jackets. The temperature is dropping for parts of the country this weekend. Angie, we can already feel it this morning here in New York. Yeah, we sure can. And it was days ago, Savannah, that we were dealing with summer-like temperatures yeah. in some of these regions. But big changes on the way. And some of those folks that were dealing with the 80s are now looking at 30s. And we've got the first frost and freeze alerts up for widespread areas of the country for the season. We've got 14 million people impacted by that. Omaha, Fargo, Bismarck, Casper, all included in that. And for good reason. Look at these temperatures this morning. You see that? 29 degrees in Miles City this morning. Bismarck at 37, Valentine at 39, mid 40s for North Platte, even Denver into the low 40s this morning. So yes, it is quite chilly and much cooler than it has been uh, in recent days. And it's going to stay that way for folks that are already seeing it. And it's going to end up that way for folks that not that haven't quite seen the cool down just yet. We're talking about the Northeast. Look at these temperatures by this afternoon. Still 73 degrees in New York, upper 70s in Washington, D.C. Those 70s are long gone by the time we get into tomorrow, though. The 50s will start to take shape and move a little farther to the east, including places like Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Detroit, all into the 50s for your high temperature tomorrow. So, yes, jackets will be needed for any Saturday plans you have across the Midwest. Our temperatures aren't going to get out of the 50s in a lot of spots. And as we look ahead to the end of the weekend in places like New York, low 60s for your high temperature, upper 50s as we get back into our next work week in New York. Places like Burlington will sit into the upper 50s Sunday through through Tuesday, so the fall will definitely be uh, out there here as we get through the weekend and into our upcoming week. But the cold front that is bringing us those cooler temperatures, it's also going to bring some folks some rain, specifically parts of the Northeast uh, are going to deal with some of that rain as the front moves into that region. We'll also see Philippe that will transition to post-tropical system and it'll move into portions of New England. So the rain that you'll see in places like New York, that is from the cold front. Uh, the rain that you'll see in places like Maine, Vermont, Connecticut, that is from post-tropical uh, Philippe. So we've got a whole lot of rain. These two kind of systems merge eventually by the time we get into Sunday morning. But either way, we've got heavy downpours with the potential for flooding with a lot of folks, uh, Savannah. And we've got those gusty winds. Could Places like Bar Harbor could see up to 30, 35, even close to 40 mile per hour winds. This is one of those weeks where you're like, how was it 80 two and, days ago? And, and we're how about do to I see. dress? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, how do I dress? This morning, I was like, I don't even have a hood. And I hope you brought your umbrella. I know. I I didn't. So wow. that's great. And I'm wearing sandals. It's just, I'm super prepared. And okay. last one. Thank you so much. Well, coming up, America's got lottery fever yet again with the Powerball jackpot now up to an estimated $1.4 billion. Later in the hour, we might just have a new winning strategy that could give you an edge. But first, from lottery winners to Vegas losses off the casino floor as the fallout from that crippling cyber attack now has a price tag. We'll tell you about that up next.
We are back with new details on that crippling cyber attack that caused chaos for a number of hotels and casinos in Las Vegas last month. MGM Resort says the attack has already cost them, get this, more than $100 million. And remember Clorox? They had one too. They say its quarterly profit also took a big hit due to a recent cyber attack. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has the latest. A string of casinos has lost big in Vegas, and also critical customer data was stolen, driver's license and social security numbers. But it's the eye-popping number that the MGM has lost that has many talking on the Vegas Strip. For one major Vegas resort group, the losses are huge. After a September cyber hack on MGM resorts wreaked havoc on the chain's dozen properties. This morning, we're learning the damage and cleanup from those attacks will cost the casino and hotel chain over $100 million. A company of MGM size should have the proper protocols in place to be able to prevent this type of attack. In a statement, the company admitting hackers obtained information from customers who stayed at their resorts before March 2019, including names and contact information, as well as driver's license numbers and a limited number of social security and passport numbers. However, MGM says because of its fast response, customers' payment card information and bank accounts were not compromised. MGM CEO Bill Hornbuckle telling customers, we regret this outcome and sincerely apologize to those impacted, adding, your trust is paramount to us. The aftermath taking an ongoing toll on the company. Occupancy was down 5% in September from the same time last year, but MGM hopes bookings will return to normal by next month. If it starts to feel the impact because people are concerned about the security of their data, then that starts to make security a differentiator. Meanwhile, popular cleaning brand Clorox warning a recent cyber attack is hurting its sales and production too. The company's profits taking a massive hit last quarter. We see it happen across sector, not because they're looking to cross sectors, but because they're looking for where they can actually uh, create an attack and uh, expose vulnerabilities. Both Clorox and MGM have not released details on how hackers were able to bypass their security systems. Back to you. All right, Miguel, thank you so much. Now let's get you some more international headlines. Russian President Vladimir Putin is suggesting a new narrative for that plane crash that killed the leader of the Wagner mercenary group. Molly Hunter joins us now with that and more. Hey, Molly, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. That's right. President Putin spoke about this yesterday uh, without providing many details. Now, no evidence were given, not many specific details. President Putin offered up a pretty wild theory involving drugs and alcohol. Putin said it was likely that hand grenades took down the plane of his biggest rival, Yevgeny Prigozhin. Of course, he was the former head of the Wagner Group. Now, to be very clear, Savannah, U.S. intelligence said Prigozhin's plane crashed because of an intentionally set off explosive detonated on board at multiple U.S officials have told NBC News that intelligence pointed to sabotage. Now, moving to Italy near Naples, the Italian government is planning for a possible evacuation of tens of thousands of people that live near the Campi Flegri super volcano. Now, there have been more than a thousand earthquakes in that area just over the last month, and there is now concern for the 500,000 people that live nearby. And finally, right here at home in the UK, again, no chestnuts involved this time, everyone's favorite royal, the Princess of Wales, Kate showing off her rugby skills in a wheelchair to highlight the disability rugby league and inclusivity in the sport. All right, Molly Hunter, thank you so much. Well, tributes are pouring in this morning for NFL Hall of Famer and actor Dick Butkus. His family says Butkus died peacefully in his sleep at his Malibu, California home. Considered to be one of the greatest football players of all time, he spent nine seasons playing for his hometown Chicago Bears in the 1960s and the 1970s. The hard-hitting Butkus was a two-time NFL Defensive Player of the Year and first team all NFL six times. He retired in 1973 after suffering a right knee injury. He later went into acting, appearing on the TV series MacGyver and the movies Any Given Sunday and Gremlins 2. Dick Butkus was 80 years old. Well, coming up, new health concerns this morning over those popular weight loss medications like Ozempic. The rare but serious side effects that are showing up in a new study. Stay with us. That's next.
We are back now with new concerns over popular weight loss drugs like Ozempic and Wagovi. The two drugs normally used for patients with diabetes could be having some unintended side effects for many who are looking to shed pounds and use these drugs. Well, the fallout is actually also being felt by the food industry. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Goss joins us now to explain what those side effects we're talking about are. Some kind of serious. Stephanie, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. You know, we've all seen the incredible examples of dramatic weight loss, but there's also growing evidence the active ingredient in drugs like Ozempic and Wagovi can cause rare but serious side effects for some users. Now, a first-of-its-kind research uh, and study shows that those side effects among people who weren't diabetic but took the drugs to lose weight. There may be an ugly downside to the new generation of wildly popular weight loss medications, including the diabetes drug Ozempic and its sister drug Wagovi, which is approved for weight loss rare but serious gastrointestinal problems. New research published in the Journal of the American Medical Association focused specifically on non-diabetic patients who took this class of weight loss drugs known as GLP-1s. It found a greater risk of adverse effects compared to a different type of weight loss medication. And according to the study, people who use them had a nine times higher risk of pancreatitis, more than four times higher risk of a bowel obstruction, and a more than three and a half times higher risk of stomach paralysis. The study indicated that most severe symptoms are rare. Ozempic's website does say side effects can vary widely, from nausea and vomiting to changes in vision and even kidney problems. The popular drugs have been used for years to treat diabetes, but recently a growing number of people have started taking them for weight loss. I was on it for three weeks and I felt absolutely terrible. Many other patients say the weight loss benefits far outweigh any discomfort. I couldn't be happier. I'm so, I could do a little happy dance. Nova Nordis, the company that makes Ozempic and Wagovi, telling NBC News it stands by the safety of its products, which include the possible side effects listed on their labels. The company also noting that much of the data from the study was collected beginning in 2006, before its products were even on the market. Use of the drugs has jumped 300% over the past three years, and the boom is showing no signs of slowing. Morgan Stanley estimates 24 million Americans could be taking them by 2035. According to the Wall Street Journal, the trend is something the food industry is watching closely because people who take the drugs feel fuller longer. They quite simply eat less. And industry experts say that means brands may need to adapt. It reduces the appetite. And so that I could see a return to portion control packaging that was big almost two decades ago. Back to those side effects, drug maker Novo Nordisk also says patient safety is a top priority and the company is working closely with the FDA to, quote, continuously monitor the safety profile of its medications. Just last week, the FDA updated the warning label on Ozempic to warn users of a possible link to serious intestinal blockages. So these these conditions are very serious, but they are also are rare. Such a conversation about how many people are using them, why you're using them, and now things like this, as well as then the potential business impact. Yes, and and the bottom line is talk to your talk to your doctor because how you handle the risk will depend on whether you are a diabetic and you're Mm -hmm. facing other very serious health risks or you're obese and facing very other serious health risks. If you are just taking this to lose some pounds, this might not be worth it. Yeah, definitely. All right, Stephanie Goss, thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, one person could have a very good weekend, a very good life, apparently. The third largest Powerball jackpot in history is up for grabs Saturday night with an estimated price of $1.4 billion. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirst joins us now from a convenience store in Cleveland. Of course, we got to get somewhere where we can see people buying some of those tickets. What are you seeing, Jesse? Are people coming in? Uh, well, we're definitely buying a ticket, Savannah. Look at this. <laughs> this you. is what we're talking about. $1.4 billion up for grabs. Now, I just want to uh, put this disclaimer on the record. This is not the Morning News Now ticket. This is my ticket. So <laughs> don't anybody over there be trying to get in on these winnings, please. Um, thank you. I'll do a quick pick ticket. So all it takes is two bucks for a chance to win $1.4 billion up for grabs. And if this jackpot holds, this is slated to be the third largest jackpot in Powerball history. It comes after a July 19th drawing. Thank you. Hey, Dana, don't show my numbers. Come on, man. What are you doing over there? Um, that was also a major prize. The Powerball says that this is going to be the first time in history ever that we have seen back-to-back 
billion dollar grand prizes. And again, the estimated jackpot right now, even bigger than it was in July, $1.4 billion, and it's all mine. So what's going on with how these jackpots keep getting bigger and then there's fewer winners and we have these back-to-back -back billions? It seems like we keep talking about this. I've, I've seen you buying quite a few lottery tickets on television for us because we keep covering this story. Is something going on? Yes, I might be single-handedly fueling yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the why it's a one point four billion. I mean, yeah. We, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we get to these massive runs, right? Like, it's been since July, and, and it is just climbing. And when we start talking about it more, we start seeing uh, more and more tickets getting bought. But your odds are, are terrible on this, I, I should point out. We're talking about less than one out of 292 million. Those are your chances of winning the grand prize. But I have a couple new strategies, okay? Ready, Savannah? This is okay. new this time. We haven't talked about this before. So the Multi-State Lottery Association told me just 18% of jackpot-winning tickets have had numbers that people pick themselves that players pick. What I just did is called quick pick. The mm -hmm. computer decided for me. That has been the way that 82% of jackpot winning tickets oh. have been put together. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in good company. Uh, we've also got some good numbers to keep in mind. 52 and 24. And since 2015, the Powerball, or the Multi-State Lottery Association tells me that number 52 has come up the most in drawings on a jackpot winning ticket in the white ball section. And then for the red Powerball, number 24. So three things to keep in mind. 52, 24, the computer. Let the computer decide. I'm not showing you these numbers. Dana wants to get in on my ticket. So that's They're where you need to do They're not your numbers. They're the computer's the computer. numbers. So maybe that'll work. Don't be so proprietary, yeah, Jesse. Yeah, let the computer yeah. decide. Take it out of your hands. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I'm sure you're going to be in a good position. By the end of the day, you're going to have like 20 of these after you do this all day for us on TV. So best of luck to you, Jesse. This Jessie. is the one. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right, coming up, some breaking economic data out just moments ago. We're going to dig into September's jobs report and, of course, what it all means for your wallet with our team, our go-to team, next on Morning News Now. We've got some breaking news. The September jobs report just out, giving us a new snapshot of the state of our economy. Some interesting numbers here. More than 336,000 jobs were added last month. But get this, that is far more than the 170,000 jobs economists had predicted. The unemployment rate in the U.S. stands at 3.8 percent. That remains unchanged from the month of August. Breaking it all down for us, who else but our economic dream team, NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung at the big board and Investopedia editor-in-chief Caleb Silver here on set with us. Good morning to both of you. Brian, let's start with you. Break down these numbers for us. What do these new job numbers look like by industry? Where were jobs added? Yeah, good morning, Savannah. Some of the re reactions I'm seeing online, holy moly, wow. <laughs> I mean, these are crazy numbers when you take a look at comparatively where we were in the month Absolutely. of August. In that month, we added 187,000 jobs again as you mentioned, in the month of September, we added, check this out, 336,000 jobs. What's really interesting about this, too, is that this is well above the pace of job ads we had seen in the earlier part of this year. Something very also uh, worth noting is that the unemployment rate did stay at 3.8%. Yes, that's a little bit above the 3.4% we had seen in the beginning of the year, but still historically low by all standards. And again, that tends to fluctuate anyway. So again, 336,000 jobs added in one month. It's been a, a, quite a while since we've seen a number that. Big. Yeah, wow. And, and quite a number, right, since it's been quite so off from what economists had predicted. Caleb, let's bring you in here. What is standing out to you as you're just starting to look over these numbers? Well, first of all, we spit out our coffee backstage when we heard this number because this is almost Did double really? what we expected. Yeah, in a metaphorical <laughs> way. That said, they also revised up the job gains for July and August, which means the labor market wow. is actually stronger than we thought. So hiring continues pretty aggressively. Companies maybe don't want to get flat-footed. Brian talked about the sectors here with leisure and hospitality getting a lot of jobs mm -hmm. in an off-season. That's very interesting right. going into the fourth quarter here, so much stronger than we expected. This is also telling us that the Fed's uh, intention to bring down job growth is not really working right now. Yeah. All right. So let's use this number to try to widen out here, Brian. What does the September report tell us about the state of the economy? There's been so many questions about this for so long, looking at all these different indicators. What does this one say? And also about the security of the current labor market? Yeah. And Savannah, when it comes to the labor market, I think that a lot of people are wondering what is the impact of the strikes here. Uh, and I know that Caleb's going to get to it in a second, yeah. but I did want to point out that really the big drivers here didn't have anything to do with any of those headlines we were seeing because leisure and hospitality bars and restaurants added 96,000 jobs wow. just in that month. So bars and restaurants driving a lot of the job gains in the month 
of September. Jobs at the mall also added quite a number of 19,700 in the month. And motion picture sound recording, we did watch the Hollywood strikes. We have to remember that the survey period for when this jobs report was done mm -hmm. actually preceded the agreements that we saw from some of the agree right, exactly. uh, from some of the groups. So actually, that uh, showed a contraction of 6,600 jobs. But again, that's uh, something that we really have to remember. Uh, we'll have basically reversed once we get next month's report. Yeah, Caleb, let's talk more about that because we can't really talk about labor numbers right now without recognizing how many strikes in many different industries we're seeing right now between Hollywood, but as well, of course, the auto industry. How does that come into play here? Well, obviously, it's not being picked up in these numbers, but you also have the Yellow Trucking Corp, which went bankrupt, yeah. laid off a lot of people. There were 47, 48,000 job cuts, actually, last month, mm -hmm. but the gains far surpassed that. So employers are still staffing up. They, maybe they don't believe a recession is coming. Maybe they don't believe the consumers tapped out. Brian mentioned it. Leisure and hospitality and the mall, that's where we spend discretionary money. That's where employers are adding staff right now. That's very interesting. And that's also where the holiday season, we really start to feel things, right, Brian? Is that what's coming into play here? Yeah, well, I mean, look, we're going to start to see some of those uh, Christmas things already come out of the yeah. stores already. Ooh. But we've seen some companies already announce their intention for ramping up hiring. Amazon says that they're going to hire more people this year than they did last year. This is one of the largest employers in the country that could have about 200,000 seasonal employees this year. So, again, this retail number would be something that we could watch, especially on the delivery delivery and logistics side as well, given Amazon's presence in those industries. But again, things we'll have to watch as we get towards that October report, which will also reflect the UAW strike. So that's going to be a very, very interesting right. report to look at. Brian, Caleb, we knew these numbers were coming. We knew you both were coming. We were not expecting these numbers. So thank you very much for pouring over it so quickly and walking us through. Good to see you both. Well, we are now going to head to some financial headlines and stay on this takeover that would make ExxonMobil the top U.S. oil producer. CNBC's Pippa Stevens joins us with that. Another money news. Hey, Pippa, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. Well, there is a major deal that could be in the works in the oil sector. As you said, reports say ExxonMobil is in talks to buy shale driller Pioneer Natural Resources in a deal that could be worth as much as $60 billion. The acquisition could be announced in the coming days. A deal would potentially be the world's largest this year, topping Pfizer's $43 billion takeover of Seagen. It would also be Exxon's biggest acquisition since it merged with Mobile back in 1999. X is testing three tiers of premium service, which would allow the company formerly known as Twitter to charge customers different amounts based on how many ads are shown. Bloomberg reports CEO Linda Yaccarino disclosed the test during a briefing with lenders recently. The premium plan, which currently costs $7.99 per month, would be split into basic, standard, and plus. It could let X woo consumers who may not want to pay full price for the premium service. Elon Musk has also floated the idea of charging everyone who uses X a small fee. And Amazon is offering free grocery delivery for orders over $100. That's down from 150 as the company looks to boost its fresh food business. A spokesperson says the new pricing went into effect last night. Prime customers will pay $6.95 for orders of $50 to $100 and $9.95 for those under $50. Bucks. Shoppers without Prime will still be charged between $7.95 and $13.95, depending on the size of the order and the delivery window. Savannah, back to you. All right, Pippa Stevens, thank you so much. Well, this morning we are getting new insight into life in the workplace for women. Global management consulting for McKinsey and Company and LeanIn.org teamed up to release the ninth annual Women in the Workplace report. It's the largest comprehensive survey exploring the state of women in corporate America. For more, we are joined by Lorena Yee. She is a senior partner at McKinsey and Company. And Rachel Thomas is a CEO of LeanIn.org. Again, the two that teamed up on this. Thank you both very much for being here. Rachel, I'll start with you just to tell us how this came about, how you conducted the research for this report. Every year we conduct this report for the last nine years. This year we surveyed 27,000 employees. So this is big data. And this year we focused on debunking four myths that we think are holding women back in the workplace. And the one that we think is most critical to discuss is this idea that for some reason women are less ambitious as a result of the pandemic or flexibility. And in reality, nothing could be further from the truth. We know women are highly ambitious, more ambitious than they were before the pandemic, just as ambitious as men. And when they work remote in the hybrid, they're ambition does not diminish at all. In fact, there's signs that flexible work is unlocking women's ambition. Mm, mm, interesting. That That is interesting, especially when we've heard so much about the conversation around return to work and if it's working for people, if it's not working for people, 
look at what it's doing potentially for women, for moms, for families. Um, Lorena, let's take a closer look at, at some of these other findings. So the report found that despite hard-fought gains in leadership positions, women remain underrepresented. I don't think that's a surprise, but what was the takeaway here? Why it is, how it can change? Yeah, I mean, what we see in the C-suite, the most senior women, is that one in four of those members are women. And while we're making progress, it's slow. I mean, we've been doing this research for almost a decade, and we're just seeing small gains. Now, we celebrate them, but if you look at the rest of the pipeline and representation, we just don't see the progress. Mm. So, for example, that very first promotion, I think we can all remember how excited we were to become a manager, to kind of go from that entry level to that first step up. And guess what? For every 100 men who receive that opportunity, only 87 women receive it. And by the way, if you're a black woman, that number was 54 this last year. So we do see hmm. disparities at every step of the way. Mm. Rachel, I really like one of these findings. Um, it's, a, I mean, I like a lot of them. I like the whole report, but this specifically, that women remain highly ambitious despite facing stronger headwinds than men. Talk to us about some of the challenges when we say headwinds, but, but how have you kind of measured something like ambition and what it is that you really found out of that? Yeah, so in terms of ambition, we looked at interested in being promoted, interest in career, interest in being a senior leader. And as I said, women show up as highly ambitious, particularly young women. Three and four say they want to be a senior leader. In terms of those headwinds, what we're talking about are microaggressions, and there's nothing micro about them. They have a huge impact on women. We know women are twice as likely to be spoken over, twice as likely to be mistaken for someone more junior, be challenged in their area of expertise. And for Black women and other women with traditionally marginalized identities, these microaggressions are more othering and more demeaning. It's just one example. Asian women are six times more likely to be mistaken for a colleague of the same race and ethnicity as white employees are. Imagine going to the, through the workplace every day and facing that mental minefield of microaggressions. And here's what happens as a result. Women are more likely to sell shield. They tone themselves down. They hesitate before speaking up. They're worried about showing up as perfect in the workplace as a result, a very natural result of these microaggressions. And that means companies are missing out on their best ideas. And we also know that when women experience microaggressions and self shield, they're four times more likely to be burned out and three mm. times more likely to leave their organization. So this is a retention issue for companies as well. Absolutely, retention, such an important conversation to come out of a report like this. Um, Lorena, also you touched on this a little bit, but talk through some of the different ways this was broken down, uh, different racial aspects, things like that, women with disabilities. What did you find when you look at specific barriers faced by certain groups? A um, couple things. We looked at the intersectionality. So we look at women overall. We're always comparing them to men so that we understand how that fares. We looked at women of color. We looked at Asian women. We looked at black women. We looked at Latino women. And what you see in every step of the way, those day-to-day -day experiences that Rachel just mentioned, women get an unfair shake. And if you're a black woman or you're a Latina woman, it's even harder. You're more likely to hear those demeaning remarks. You're less likely to get promoted. And just every step is harder. But here's the thing. That's pretty depressing. And there is some rays of hope. Going back to that first statement around flexibility, I think it's really interesting that women are saying that they actually want to see that flexibility. They're experiencing it. And by the way, women of color, white women, they're saying we are as productive when we work flexibly, when we work in the office. And by the way, men are saying that too. So one of the rays of hope in the report is that this flexibility piece has been a massive unlock. And that's great because women are ambitious. And if they have the tools to succeed, we have better odds. Rachel Thomas, Lorena Lee, thank you, Lorena Yee, excuse me. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for conducting this study. It's such important findings and a really great conversation to have this morning. Thank you. Well, coming up, if it's Friday, you know we've got your can't miss list on deck. And this week we are previewing the highly anticipated return of Marvel's Loki to Disney+. Plus. Stick around. That's up next. Welcome back. This is interesting. There haven't been any new episodes for four years of the show Suits. But it is still breaking records. The 2010s legal drama has now managed the most weeks at the top of Nielsen's streaming top 10, 12 weeks in a row. 
Suits ended its nine-season run back in 2019, but became a streaming sensation on Netflix over the summer, while the Hollywood strike slowed the supply of new shows. Also, it's kind of interesting, right, to watch Meghan Markle before she was the Duchess of Sussex. So I think that's probably part of it. I, I will admit, I watched a little bit of this. All right, well, the Kelsey family has was well known already before the budding romance between son, Travis Kelsey, and pop icon, Taylor Swift. And the family is led by matriarch Donna Kelsey, a familiar face for both Chiefs fans and Eagle fans alike after last season's Super Bowl run when she had two sons on opposing teams. She joined the Today Show to talk about her own recent rise to fame and how she parents two football stars. All of a sudden, it's you sweet. are thrust into the middle of every conversation. Mm, yeah. People know you on the street. Mm -hmm. They see you with your sons. How have you adjusted to this? Can I have a selfie, Mama Kelsey? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, you just treat everybody with respect and kindness, and they return it to me. So mm -hmm. it's really kind of neat. Well, mm -hmm. you probably thought that having two sons facing each other in the Super Bowl for the first mm -hmm. time ever yeah. was big yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. things have gotten even bigger yeah. lately yeah. yeah it's like every week it's like something new like really <laughs> yeah it's it's uh, i feel like i'm in some kind of an alternate universe <laughs> yeah. it's just really really strange but uh it's fun it's a great ride um you know at times it gets a little annoying but most of the time people are just so so sweet so kind so generous and uh uh, you know, I, I can't, but uh, who, what mother doesn't like to hear their kids are great? Well, it, it's you know. fun watching you on the box. We only could see you on the, at home on our TVs. Mm -hmm. um, was that the first time you'd met uh, Taylor? Uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's fairly new, so yeah. I, I don't like to talk about it. Um, it's just one of those things where, you know, obviously everybody saw me. I was in the, I was in the boxes with, yeah. with her, and, um, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, another thing that's amped up my life yeah what was she like what was yeah. it i mean you so you got to know her a little bit you got to see the couple games how was it it was okay yeah <laughs> well, we both we both met her and she's we've always sort of just been delighted by her way yeah yeah yeah, yeah. did you did did travis say mom if you get on the today show and, and start spilling the beans uh, you get a little warning uh, it's not so much a warning is it it's his personal life yeah and you know I'll talk about my life yeah. and when the kids were little and I was with them but you know they're men now yeah, yeah. they're grown and they've got their own lives and there isn't a man alive that's gonna talk to their mom about their personal life yeah. it's just not gonna happen Have you ever tried, my mom used to try to set us up when we were younger and we we're getting older she was yeah. like okay you're at this age I met someone really nice at Foot Locker you might like this person <laughs> did you ever try to set your, no. your kids up no, no. never no uh -uh. no they did their own. No, Thanks. I don't give them advice. Um, you know, they've got to sink or swim on their own, and they have to make their own mistakes and make their own wonderful, you know, accomplishments in life. And you know, it, and then they know it's theirs. Yeah. Was that your parenting style when you were raising them? Because we're Pretty we're much. raising kids now, and you'd like to have kids who. Yeah, the, the more they can be in the decision process, the better. Yeah. You know, it, I really think it's important that, you know, you follow them. What do they want to do? Yeah. What do they love? What you know, if you can support them, that's the best you can possibly do. Yeah. Sometimes you can't financially. Some families can't do it. But, you know, there's all kinds of um, ways that you can help them achieve their dreams. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, what more could you want as a parent? How, what's it like managing the spotlight, not just for yeah. you, but helping, you know, them manage the spotlight? Because there's a lot that's fun about it, and it's a lot that's yeah. intense, and not everyone can understand that. Yeah, it is... It's kind of crazy at times, but I love a thrill. I love theme parks. I love all that kind of stuff. I love people. So it's just, it's up my alley. Mm -hmm. I, I don't feel intimidated by it. I just embrace it all. So it's kind of fun. Well, Donna Kelsey went on to say it's been an honor for her to travel with her sons to see all their games. She was also gifted with two friendship bracelets, courtesy of Hoda and Savannah. That has to do with Taylor Swift. And you know what? I'm going to bring in our friend Brian Balthazar, who's doing our next segment with us in just a moment. As you all know, can't miss list. Um, that's, I just learned a new term from our fabulous executive producer, Sean. It's called a pancake block okay. when you're just coming to a halt. Yeah. That was a pancake block for the ladies on the Taylor Swift questions. It, right, a lot of bobbing and weaving. Is that in boxing? It's bobbing. Uh, naturally, I'm a boxing guy. Yeah. Bobbing well, and weaving. We're football, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Jeez, <laughs> right, sorry. That's, uh, my terminology <laughs> is limited. The two of us at sports. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> all right. Let's 
let's move on because we can't handle let's. that conversation. All right, finally, it is time, as always, for our Can't Miss List, a wrap up of all the movies, shows you need to watch this weekend, and we've got Brian Balthazar, as always. It's so much fun when you're here. I love being here. Thank I know, you. and love when you're here on, on set in person. Okay, horror. We got to talk about this. Right. It's October. It's Halloween vibes, and we've got right. a new something. The Royal Hotel, set in the Australian outback. It's a thriller, right? Right. Tell us yes. About this. And so this is uh, Julia Garner and uh, Jessica Henley, um, and this is it's it's directed uh, by Kitty Green, and it's a story of these two women, young women, who mm -hmm. go out to like on a on a road trip and or on a, a hiking trip, and they run out of money, so they take a job at a pub that's called the Royal Hotel, and things get a little like really kind of. Uh, dramatic, scary, okay. awkward. But these movies are tend to be, by Kitty Green written, um, tend to be critically loved and often viewer panned because they're not, like, they kind of almost happen in real time. You know, when you see uh -huh. someone in the movie drink the whole drink and you're like, okay, can we move? But um, but it gets a little scary, uh, but they don't have these big movie endings. So it's a very much kind of almost like a, a, a piece, a slice of life of these two women as they experience really creepy okay. things happening. Pretty scary, though? I think, I think dramatic and... And ick factor, but I don't know that it's going to be like horror, full on horror. Okay, okay, got it. Um, I like the not sound of this next one. It's a New York based rom com. Yes. Some fun twists in here. Yes. What should we know about this? Okay, this one is great. Okay, this one has uh, Peter Dinklage. It's called She Came to Me. Um, Peter Dinklage, uh, we have Anne Hathaway, and Ugh. They're, they're married. She is his former therapist. He is a composer who has a creative block. So she encourages okay. him to go out and find inspiration. Unfortunately, he finds it in the form of another woman, played by Marissa Tomei. And a one-night stand turns into just a dark comedy. You know, uh, Marissa Tomei's character, she's being lauded in this role because it's so quirky and weird. A little fun fact, she's it was so initially great. slated for Nicole Kidman and Amy Schumer years oh, ago, but it I got love lost. I know, that. right? And Steve Carell. And it was lost in development, and then, you know, everything happened. But this is getting a lot of fun response to Isn't that so cool when you hear who woulda, coulda, oh, shoulda been in it? I know. I always want to know, too. And then yeah. you wonder, like, do they regret it? Or are they happy? Right? Or like, I why didn't too. it pan yeah. out? Yeah. Like, they're so great, too. Um, okay, we just talked about Halloween a second ago, but I want to bring it back in. Hocus Pocus. Right. What is it? It's 30th anniversary? Yes, and it's coming back to birthday? theaters. The re-release, the classic. So cool. You were a Hocus Pocus gal, right? Oh, a huge Hocus yeah. Pocus gal. So, huge. Yeah, they get trapped. You know, they kind of get brought back to life, and now they're trying to preserve, because they were hung in Salem. Kids bring them back to life by accident, and it's it's comedy. It's far <laughs> it's fun, it's funny, and it was so became such a cult classic, they did another one. Oh my gosh, yeah. which was what got me on Disney Plus, was yeah, to see that exactly. next one. So that tells you how much I love Focus <laughs> Focus. Okay, moving to shows now, Everything Now, it's this powerful series. Tell us a little right. bit about this teenage girl who's just out of the hospital for an eating disorder. Right. And really important stuff here. I know it's being praised for how it handles it, which right. is obviously a tough thing to tackle, especially in something scripted. Yeah, well, she's been in this rehab facility for seven months. She comes back and she finds that seven months is a long time in high school teenage years. Mm. So she creates kind of a bucket list of all the things she wants to experience because all of her friends have been doing things like drinking, you know, experimenting with boys and girls and all that stuff. And she creates a list that she wants to accomplish all these things. So it tackles that eating disorder, but it also tackles this kind of coming of age and growing up. And it's kind of a euphoria with a different bent. You know, it's kind of, of that kind of teen angst drama. Mm. And genre. this is a Netflix, right? Yes, yeah. Netflix. A series. You yes. can stream it at home, a yes. series. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Also, I know there's something else really big. Marvel World. Right. Okay. Something else you can stream right. at well, home. You know, you know something about jumping the time space continuum when you run to the Today Show and back in like five <laughs> minutes, right? You know about shifting time. I was like, time. no, I don't. Right. Okay, I guess. <laughs> yes, but Loki is on Disney Plus, and Tom Hiddleston is a god of mischief. And this is for those people who need that slow IV drip of the Marvel universe, that kind of thing, because it's just action. I mean, if you watch the trailer, you don't really get a sense of what's going on because like it's like it's again like space and time are always constantly shifting in the universe it's see, like you see like it's hard to right. explain the plot in, in this is season two of this series on disney plus and it's uh, releasing episodes every week but it's fun it's fantastical it's sci-fi it's it's adventure it's uh action and this is marvel universe right uh, no i think it's actually uh, avengers the essential of en avengers, oh, avengers. Not, okay, okay. Now, I don't know. now i had a morning moment I so i know all the, yeah. all the superheroes <laughs> stuff is so hard for me to keep up with yeah very interesting though on that one because i know how popular it is season two already yeah. all right yeah. Brian Balthazar, it is always so much fun when you're here. What else? You. Uh, anything else you're going to be watching this weekend? Oh, I'm going to watch Quantum Leap on NBC. I don't know if you remember the original. This one's great, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. There you go. And guess what we're going to have to talk about next week? What's that? You know what we can't miss next week? We're going to be talking Aeros about a little. I, I, I mean, come on. I'm, I know. Yes, I was going to say. It's going to be a whole segment. It's going to be right. a whole segment. Brian Balthazar, thank you so much. Always so much fun to have you with us. Happy weekend. Have you a too. Good weekend. Thank you. And that is going to do it for this hour of morning news. Now, thanks for hanging with us. Stick with us, though. The news continues right now.
Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.